Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, today, we have Paul, who's going to talk about concurrent inequality. All right, I'm just going to share my screen. All right, so I guess if anyone has any questions or stuff, just interrupt me at any point. Or I guess you can message in and Willie will interrupt me, just interrupt me. All right, so let, let's start. Let's, uh, so right, so we want to talk about the Poincaré inequality on metric spaces. So I guess uh, let's start with, you know, our setting, which will be a metric space. Well, a little more than a metric space. So a metric measure space. Measure space. Uh, we'll call this x d mu. D is our distance function, our metric function. And mu is our measure. Uh, we need our measure to have a few properties. So first, uh, we want mu to be Borel regular. So by this, uh, I want open sets to be measurable. And all sets, uh, how do I say this? So if, uh, so let's, uh, so what do I want? I want let A be a measurable set. Then there exists a Borel set, a Borel set B, such that they have the same measure. So this is our this is our general setup for a metric measure space. Now, to be able to do analysis on on these spaces, we need one extra property. So we need another definition called doubling. So a measure is doubling if the measure of the ball of a ball of 2r, right, ball centered at x of radius 2r is bounded above by some fixed constant, c, d, subscript d for doubling, uh, the measure of the ball of radius r. So let's, let's do some examples of things. Uh, so what is a doubling? So now examples of doubling, I'm going to say metric measure spaces for short. So doubling metric measure space is just metric measure space with a doubling measure, um, right? So the measure has this property. An example, Rn with the Euclidean distance and Lebesgue measure. Let's see why. So if we just look at this, um, the ratio of, I'm going to now say the ball to B to be, you know, the ball of radius 2r will be 2b, and b will just be the ball radius r. If I divide these two, oops, b, we want this bounded above by our constant, by some constant, right? That's our definition. So this equals, we know from, uh, I guess, measure theory that, and the properties of Lebesgue measure and area on Rn, that this, that the top one will be 2r to the n times the measure of the unit ball. And the bottom one will be r to the n times the measure of the unit ball. Right, this is properties of a big measure. So this just equals to the n. This is constant. Other examples will be, would be uh, manifolds. with Ricci non-negative. This, this, so now you can think of spheres do this, uh, quotients of spheres, things along these lines. Now maybe a non-example, so you can see what's happening. So let's just look at R. Um, with Euclidean distance again. And now I want my measure to be 
cinch dx, where right dx is just a normal Lebesgue measure. So now we'll look at these two things again. Uh, so maybe I'll call my measure mu here, right? So mu d mu equals cinch x dx. So mu of 2b over mu of b. All right, our balls now are just uh, like minus r to r is b. So this will equal the integral from, um, sorry, minus 2r to 2r cinch of x dx divided by um, the integral from r to r minus r to r of cinch x dx. And then instead of doing these integrals out, I can just tell you this is bounded above by uh, like four cosh of x. Uh, oh. Four cosh of r, sorry. Is it not just zero divided by zero? Um, I thought the hyperbolic sign is symmetric. Sorry, sorry, you're right. Willie's right. Cosh. <laughs> and now this, now this, now this is bounded above by Sinchabar. So you're right, right. Sorry, I had these backwards. Cosh. Cosh. And so now this grows. Well, first off, this is unbounded and grows exponentially in R. So this would not this would not be a doubling space because we don't have a fixed constant that uh bounds this ratio. Okay, so now let, let's, um, now I want to introduce, so that was our setting, right? Our setting is, so let's just remember our setting is a metric measure space x d mu. And now let, let's see our, our, our players. Well, there'll be two of them. The first will be the Poincaré inequality. So this is the first one. And, uh, I'll define, and then there's another one, which I'll define later. So let, let's start with the Poincaré inequality. So first, I want to say some things that the Poincaré inequality is uh, connected to. So first, so why is it interesting to look at? So it's connected to Laplacian and the heat equation. And the heat equation, uh, so Laplacian, it, it's, it's through the eigenvalues. We also have two isoparametric inequalities it's related to. And then three, connectedness in some sense. So connectedness, I want to say maybe quantitative connectedness. Quantitative connectedness. This number three is, is kind of what we'll, we'll look at later. Look at this, this version of, a, of, the, of what the Poincaré inequality means. Look at this. And four, which is, which is interesting, but we won't be able to say much, is differentiation theorems. So somehow having, a, knowing something about your Poincaré inequality tells you these four different things. And we'll focus on this quantitative connectedness, which I will define later. But let's, let's recall, oh, recall from normal analysis, right? Just analysis, analysis on Rn, what the Poincaré inequality is. So let, let's uh, give a definition or, yeah, definition, Poincaré. So let's let P be between one, well, can be one, and infinity, and be a ball in Rn. And we let u be in w1p of the ball. So this means u is an LP function on the ball. And there is an integral vector field. 
v such that for we have I'm going to define some uh, a derivative in a weak sense, but it's just this property. So this is a definition of what these brackets mean. Uh, the integral over the ball of v dot v dx, which is equal to minus the integral over b of u divergence of phi, which then we're going to say equals right back to what the definition of our brackets mean, divergence of phi. So right, this definition is it's like defined through integration by parts, integration by parts. So that's, that's, that motivates and why we want to do this definition. And phi is in C infinity, uh, compactly supported C infinity in our ball. And we will denote rebar as the gradient of phi. Again, taking our notation from um, integration by parts and things like this. Um, so now this is the setup. The Poincaré inequality says, so I'll just say pi, says the integral, the average of uh, u minus its average d mu uh, dx. Right, we're in, still in Rn, dx is less than or equal to some constant that depends on n and p times the diameter of the ball raised to the p times the average of the gradient raised to the p. And where ub is just the average over the ball of u. So this is just notation. So somehow we see that uh, having a Poincaré inequality relates, this is a P, gives bounds on the function by its gradient. So there's a relationship, right? A relationship between the function and its derivative. Derivative and we also want to we want to ask like what what does this constant c mean like why why do we have a constant what does it do and how does it interact with uh, not a spoiler but c is somehow somehow related to the geometry geometry of the domain so in, in this sense I defined right I defined this definition just for balls in R N. If you just replace B with omega, it works for any open set in Rn. We just say the set has a Poincaré inequality. So somehow this, this C is related to the geometry of the domain. Um, let me maybe state it, maybe state a simpler case too. So like just an example or just a simpler case, right? If U goes from the circle to R and U is in the in C1, so it has, is continuously differentiable, and its average over the circle is zero, then we get um, integral over the circle of ux squared dx is less than or equal to the integral over the circle of the gradient squared dx, right? So this, this is, um, this goes, this guy, this gets another name attached to it. So it's the Wertinger Poincaré. Has this other guy's name on it just because this is like the first example of one, because it's in one dimensions, it has, it's in respect to the L2 norm, right? So P equals two here. Um, and fun fact, now maybe it's not a fun fact, but it is a fact, um, Fourier analysis likes this inequality, uses this, and it's easy to prove using uh, Fourier analysis to prove this inequality uses this. So, and somehow like how does Fourier analysis relate back up to these four things I listed that Poincaré inequality is with? It's, whoops, it's in here somewhere, but just nice little, maybe more concrete way to think of the Poincaré inequality.
in this one dimensional case. So now let's also just look at this, uh, this Francoir inequality that, that I've written down up here. So right, or somehow our setting, right, is still a metric measure space. So the question becomes, which one of these things in, in um, this Poincaré inequality do we know how to define? Well, the left side, perfectly fine. We know how to integrate on metric measure spaces because we have a measure. And um, so, this, so, so left side's fine. We can take diameters. That's fine too, because it's a metric space. So we know how to define a diameter. Constant's a constant, so that's fine. So now it becomes, what is a gradient in this setting? And once we, so hopefully we'll be able to define a, uh, a gradient that will allow us to write down the punk grain inequality. So we become, we now have asked our questions, what is the gradient in a metric measure space. So first we need we need just a, a short definition, rectifiable curve. So this is a curve, so it's so it's a continuous function, continuous function from the interval 0, 1 into our metric measure space x, such that length length, ooh, can't spell, the length is finite. So just to define length quickly, I'll call it L of gamma, is the soup over the sum of all partitions. So, so let me just finish writing this. So we're, we look at the distance in distance in our metric space of discrete jumps along our, like, right? So we somehow just let me finish the definition, I'll draw a picture because that's all I want to do. Uh, where the soup is over all partitions, uh, zero, zero equal to T one less than, less than T n plus one, which is equal to all right, so all we're saying is we have a curve. We take n points. I'll take like four or something. I guess I need to take six because I didn't include the top. And then we just connect these with straight lines. We compute this polygonal length. And we say if for all samples, for all selections on the curve of these points, these red points, and for all amount of numbers of them, the sum is finite. This is length. So this is a rectifiable curve. And so now we can define our gradient, our substitute for the gradient. So we'll let, we say, we let, if, if u goes from x to r, and x to r measurable, we say, a Borel function, rho from x to positive r is an upper gradient. So I guess I'm going to say upper gradient. It's an upper gradient. If u of x minus u of y is less than or equal to the integral over gamma, this line interval of rho ds for all rectifiable curves gamma from that, you know, start at x and go to y from x to y. So let's see, like, why, why is this a reasonable definition? So we have the fundamental theorem of calculus which says, let's take a U in C infinity of Rn. And we have the fact from the fundamental here of calculus and a curve, right? And a curve gamma from X to Y. Fundamental theorem of calculus says U of X minus U of Y is equal to 
the integral over gamma of the gradient of u ds. And now if we just take absolute values, we see this side. And absolute values is less than or equal to the line integral of our gradient ds. So all we're doing is adapting the definition that we have from our n and making it work. Um, also, so now let's go back to our, our setting of metric measure space and say we have, so, so this is an example of an upper gradient. Let's say, let me give an example of an upper gradient. So we're in our metric measure space. We have F from X to R. Let's say it's Lipschitz, right? So this means Lipschitz. There exists some constant that f of x minus f of y is less than or equal to some constant times x minus y. And um, since this is our metric space, dx, y, right? The distance between the distance in the domain controls the distance in the target. Um, now, the upper gradient of f is, so rho for f would be, rho of x would equal the limb soup of y to x, y not equal to x, f of x minus f of y over the distance between x and y. This, most of the time, will be this L up here. So all we're doing is we're, we're computing what the derivative should be, right? So we can also see this as a, as a difference quotient. So now we can define a Poincaré inequality in a metric measure space, x to u. So we say x to mu admits a QP Poincaré inequality if First, Q and P are in one, are between one and infinity. Sorry, let me just Q, P, and one, infinity. So the metric measure space admits of Poincare inequality if there is a constant lambda between 0 and 1 and a constant c greater than 1 such that now more or less we just write down what the Poincaré inequality was before but in terms of an upper gradient so this will be the average over the lambda ball of u minus its average to the q d mu of the 1 over q is less than or equal to some constant so I'm actually going to Put a little p here, so it reminds us this is the Poincaré constant times the diameter of b times the average over the ball rho p 1 over p. And uh, right, rho is an upper gradient. Rho is upper gradient of u. OK. Any questions so far? All right. So let's do an example. So so let's see what this Poincaré constant kind of talks about. So we want to talk about the CP. So I'm, I'm going to draw a picture in R2. So our setting is now R2. And the space we're looking at, our X, looks like this, this dumbbell shape. So 
both these bulbs are supposed to be like volume one. The length of this cil the cil this cylinder neck, or I guess it's a, it's a rectangle, right? It's L and the, uh, the width will be 2R. So let's look at um, a, a one, one Poincaré inequality on this. So I'll write this down again. So this will be, and this, we'll call this dumbbell. We'll call this a dumbbell and label it just D. So this would be the integral over D, one minus, of, yeah, one minus F minus its average over D is less than or equal to some constant times the diameter times the integral of the upper gradient of F, which I'll label F, uh, grad F. So this, this is our one, one Poincaré inequality. Let's take a test function. For f, and we'll, we'll, we'll let f be, oops, f will be equal to, um, alpha is going to be some constant that I'll pick later, later. Um, so it's going to be minus alpha on the left ball. It's going to be linear, so it's going to change linearly on the cylinder. It's going to be alpha on the right ball. So what I, what I have is a function that looks like this. something like that. Um, we, we note, uh, so, so alpha is chosen just so that when I integrate, take my average over the over f, this is zero. So I'm just choosing it so it has this symmetry. Um, we'll also note that, that the gradient of f, well, it's going to be zero on the left ball. Uh, zero on the left ball. It's going to be one over L because it's linear over a length of um, one over L on the cylinder. It's going to be zero on the right ball. So let's let's plug all these this this let's plug all this into the Poincaré inequality. So what we get is the integral over d of f minus zero is less than or equal to c times the diameter times the integral over just the cylindrical part of, sorry, of um, the gradient, which is one over l. So now the left-hand side, which is the integral over d times f, f is the absolute value of f is um, so what, what do I want to say, right? So we have, we have D, I want to bound the left side below by something. So all I'm going to do is integrate over one bulb. And so I'm going to get something that looks like alpha because I took vol volume one for these bulbs. So all I'm going to do is integrate over a bulb, which has volume one of F, but F is alpha on this bulb. So alpha. So this equals alpha, this would be less than or equal to the integral over it, f minus zero, less than or equal to c times the diameter of d times one over l, and the volume of the cylinder is two pi r l. So we have seen is now alpha is less than or equal to c times, I'm just gonna call this d now, d times 2 pi r. So somehow, now, now to make this constant needs to be uniform. And so if I fix the diameter of our space up here and always draw the same, so let's say fix d, if d is fixed, this c needs to be uniform. So it needs to somehow counter the r. So if the r is really small, our c needs to be really big or else we'll break 
that is bounded below by some fixed constant alpha. So what I'm saying, right, but I can write it again in a simpler way. So simpler terms, what I'm saying is one bounds below our constant times r. I can change r, I can make r smaller, and so our constant would have to get bigger. So somehow our constant sees this width. This width is what the constant sees. And so now I want to think about this as the constant seeing like a quantitative connectedness. Because I can take out a small ball of this, um, like right here, if I, if I remove a ball like this, I'm going to disconnect my set. I can draw my ball a little bigger, I guess. But, whoops. All right, I don't need to draw a ball slightly bigger than, you know, our, our 2R, which is, 2R is small compared to the size of our total set, right? Because th these two sides over here have like volume one and are large. And so I disconnected the set somehow. And this is like a quantitative disconnectedness because I've fixed some parameters. And this parameter is like R. If I remove a ball of size R, I have now disconnected my set. Not all sets are like this, right? A huge ball of, you know, radius 27. If I remove a ball of radius 1 over 10, I'm not going to disconnect it. So it's not, somehow it's not quantitatively disconnected. This, quantitatively disconnected. So now I want to see if I can define, I guess there's one other analogy I want to make too, is, is there's, uh, I'll define something first and then make, make it later. Um, so I want to define some geometric picture define a picture that prevents being disconnected in this sense. And then the, the hope is, you know, that the picture would then imply Poincaré. Poincaré. So, so let's, let's define this picture and then, then I'll, I'll draw the picture. Uh, so it's called a SEMS, this is a guy's name, pencil of curves. So a space, X D mu, right? Our setting, our metric measure space. And I guess the other thing I should say, right? We, our first player, right? Was, was this Poincaré inequality defined here. The SEMS pencil of curves is going to be our second one. Right, this is this is our second player. And uh, for, for shortness, I will also just, I want to call this just a PC. So PC, pencil of curves. Um, so metric measure space admits a SEMS pencil of curves if there is a constant C S, I'll, I'll denote it for, for this pencil of curves, um, such that for each x and y in our space, for each x and y in x, there is a family of curves. So family of curves, gamma x, y. These are family of rectifiable curves. These curves all lie in some ball around x and y. The length of gamma isn't that much bigger, is, 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 not, is comparable to the distance between x and y. And so these are all just like set up things, not really important. All you need to think about is this family of curves between these two points. There are other two conditions that I've written here are just like technical things that need to be said, but let's not focus on them. The other important thing is this next thing, this probability measure. And there is a probability measure on gamma xy, which we will call alpha xy, such that for all Borel functions, which I will call G from X 
the positive r, we have this relationship. The integral over gamma xy, integral over gamma g ds, d alpha is less than or equal to a constant. The integral over this ball, which I will call b, g dxz over mu, so I'm over the measure of the ball of x of radius, the distance between it, x and z. I'll explain what this all means after I, I've, I've written it down plus. Now with respect to y, right? x and y were chosen, so now we're just y z measure of the ball around y of the distance from y to z, dz. So what does this mean? Oh, can I scroll? Uh, so first, let me, let me rewrite it in, in Rn. So it's the integral over gamma. The, the left side stays the same. G ds d alpha is equal to c. Integral over the ball. Well, now the distance, now we're in Rn. So we know that the, the measure of the ball in Rn is like the radius to n, right? And now we also have the radius in the numerator. So this will just be 1 over x, sorry, g. g over x minus z to the n minus 1 plus g over y minus z to the n minus 1 dz. And this is just because uh, the measure of a ball in Euclidean space looks like, whoops, the measure of x dx z equals dx z to the n times 0, 1 the measure of the ball on zero one. And so one of these ends cancels with the ends, uh, one, one of the guys in the numerator. And now I've written it with opposite values because we're in Euclidean space. So now the left-hand side, this is um, like Fubini. So, so somehow, so, so let, let me first say this. The left and the right are computing area in some way if I replace G with one. So let me do that. So these both compute area in some way, and we're comparing the different ways to compute area, compute area. The left-hand side does it in a Fubini sense, because what it says is we have our space, or sorry, I don't want to replace it with one, I want to replace it with a, a characteristic function. Right, so now we're computing the area of A, compute area of, of A. So the left side is Fubini. It says if we have our set A and we have a bunch of curves that go through it, let's say these are them, and then they, you know, they go back and connect at, you know, Y, and, and same picture over here, right? So they all come back together. Y. And what we're doing is the first, this inside integral says, well, what are these lengths? We compute all, everything that intersects, we compute these lengths, and then we add them up. So it's like computing the slices and then adding up the slices. The right-hand side is um, a little harder to see, but it is area in like polar coordinates. So if you were to switch to polar coordinates, the bottoms would become 1 over r to the n minus 1s, um, which then using the formulas, it, it just works out. So just trust me on this one. But the right side is, the left side is like a Fubini summing up slices. The right side is polar coordinates for area. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. So why that in, in, uh, like uh, inequality, like uh, that direction, why polar coordinate area is bigger? I don't know, like that's just intuitively. Intuitively, why? So, yeah. so right, so in RN, these two things will be equal. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, so yes. in, in um, the measure space setting, why would you want the inequality to go this way? Yes, yes. So uh, the, the cheap answer is because we're looking for some kind of geometric picture for the Poincaré inequality, and this is the direction you need the inequality to, to do it. It's, so that's like the cheap answer. Um, a better answer would be... Um, this, this isn't quite polar coordinates. I, I lied a little bit here. This is technically, so right, polar coordinates are dr 
d theta. Yes. This side is actually uh, no r. It's just dr d theta. So somehow, and this r, when you do polar coordinates, can get really small, which weights things to be small. And so now, since we removed this, this r, we expect it to be bigger than the area. Mm -hmm. So that's what these, these denominators actually cancel the R that stands in front of um, I see, I see. Maybe, right, maybe, because, because in R2, uh, yeah. the bottom would be just the one and we would be canceling this R. Here. So here, like uh, R is less than one. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, this a collection of curves, mm -hmm. gamma, is it finite dimensional or infinite dimensional, if, if dimension makes sense? Um, I don't know how to make sense of dimension. So what, what do you mean? So I, I just, it's, it's a family of curves connecting two points. If it has yeah. this property, so, so I, I, I do not, it needs a lot of curves in a sense, so. Yeah, suppose say, does it contain all the, say smooth curves with certain length condition. So let, let me actually, okay. right. can I just give an example of yeah, yeah, R, sure, in, sure. in R2 and then maybe, maybe this will help. So in R2, let's say an example of, of a pencil of curves. So right, these, so we have two points, X, uh, let, let's, let's actually be a little more clear with this example now that I've lost everything. Um, I, I, so I wanna be as, as precise as possible with this example. So uh, let's look at these two points, y and x, which, which are gonna be uh, minus one and one. So minus one over and one, zero. And then I'm gonna look at the curves. I'm also gonna mark off one and minus one here. When I wanna look at the curves, is the curves that do, that go like this. So I, I take a straight line to uh, this this center perpendicular mm -hmm. y-axis. Um, and then I just draw the straight line back down. And it's all, it's, it's all the curves that do this. Um, but they're not smooth, right? So I have these kinks and stuff, but this would be enough to get to get a SEMS. This is a SEMS pencil of curves. Oh, I see. So, 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 what, so what this I'm family is, would be, say, one-dimensional because it's parameterized by this uh, yeah. negative one-to-one. That's exactly right. So, so oh, I would I like see. to, if I call this, I would like to call this family, right, gamma Z, such that Z is in, you know, zero, one, cross, minus one, one. Right, this is that family, where Z is this midpoint, right? I pick the midpoint and then I draw my two lines down to, right, so this is Z. And then I draw my two point my lines down to y and x straight straight lines. Oh, I so, see. And now, now, like actually, let's continue with this example. Does this is this help answer the question about the curves? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let's let's find a, a probability measure on this. So uh, we want our probability measure, where omega, you know, a subset of of gamma. Uh, will be equal to the normal length measure on this unit interval zero one, uh, the length of z in zero cross minus one. I need more space. Right, it's just going to equal the length of z in zero one such that. gamma is in, gamma z is in omega, right? So somehow, I'm, in, in bigger words, I'm pushing forward the measure onto this set. Um, I'm, or the, I'm pushing the length measure on negative one to one onto our, our curves. And then I just need to normalize by, by the whole space. So I just need to normalize by uh, two, right? Because that would be the, that's the length of minus one to one. So now it's a probability measure. Um, now let's uh, see if I can compute how much time do I have. So, yeah, maybe that's what I'll do. So let, let me show that this is a SEMS pencil of curves. 
So if I integrate uh, a, so so I'm just going to do it for char characteristic functions again. So a intersect uh, the ball, right? This ball is is the ball that's you know x c dx dy that's given in our definition uh, up here. So it's only it's 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 localizing it, so we only care about this space. Um, and right, so now we have one over x minus z because we're in R two plus one over y minus z dz is greater than. This is true because everything's positive. Integral over x minus z dz. Uh, I'm I'm gonna drop these a and b soon because I'm. Gonna forget, and now I want to break this up into um, annuluses and add up. So, so let me sum over j integral over the annulus. So, right. So, all I'm doing is saying we're gonna look at uh, sorry, b a j. Uh, let me just draw a picture for a j. Right. So, because it'll be easier this way. I fix my point here, I look at balls around here, and I'm just looking at these annuluses. And I can get, I'll, I'll just get the ball back, basically, is what I'm thinking. So to write that down would be uh, b x comma j to the minus one c d x y. This will be b j. a j will equal bj minus bj plus one minus, uh, sorry, intersect a. But all I'm doing is breaking it up into these annuluses. And so, but the reason I want to do this is because I get to make an estimate. So I get my sum. And now I want to switch to polar coordinates like I was talking about earlier. So I integrate from minus pi over four to pi over four. Where do I get these numbers from? Well, we're doing polar coordinates and the angle here is, is gonna be a right angle and it's gonna be minus pi over four to pi over four. Um, and then we're gonna integrate from to the minus j minus one, the distance again of x of y to two to the minus j dxy. Where do I get these things from? These are the radiuses of our polar coordinates and because we're in this annulus, all we do, uh, we're in this annulus, <laughs> we go from two to the minus j minus one to two to the minus j because we're stuck in, in an annulus. Um, and now we look at just the characteristic set of a j over r, r dr d theta. So r, this r is from x minus z because that is now the radius when we switch to polar coordinates. And the characteristic function of AJ is I'm just pushing the, the integral in the inside, right? Um, and now I've, I've run out of space again. Um, let me move this down. And so now let, let's think about what's going on here a little bit. The R's cancel, which is good. And this will equal... Um, so now what, what we have is we're looking at we're, we're looking at radiuses in our uh, right so we whoops let's let's draw we have our annulus aj and what we're looking at is is these radiuses taking their length that's what the first integral does and then we're adding them all up and this as i tried to convince you in the first time is what this probability measure does and so this will be two times two, who cares? It's a constant that comes out. Sum over j, the length of gamma z intersect a j d alpha, which then turns out to be exactly what we want it once we sum over j, right? This will be the integral over gamma integral over gamma uh, chi a d s d alpha. So, so right, so this, so let's try to maybe say this a little better. Let's look at, let me just circle it. Let's look at this. And so all I'm saying here 
is that if we just look at this integral, we're finding out the length of a gamma z that intersects aj. And that's, that's what I've written here. And this is because we're in polar coordinates, so we're integrating our long radii. And I've, I've set up the game that these um, gamma z's are radii of our set of these annuluses because they start at the center and then they go to the edge. I mean, it's just the picture. Okay, so last thing I'll say is how, how do these relate? So there's a there's a theorem that says x d mu met is a, is a doubling is doubling incomplete. Then we have this, we have a, a pencil of curves is equivalent to a 1-1 one, one Poincare inequality. And so maybe I can, what do I have? Five minutes left. Let's see if I can just convince you of one thing, maybe I can convince you of the rest with words. But um, so let, let, let's so two things to say. This direction to the one one Poincaré, not bad, just tedious. The other direction, hard. Dur. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to you know maybe quickly outline what happens in the, this forward direction in here. So the proof of this thing. So let, let's let's uh, get our setup. So we have xy in our metric measure space x. We have gamma xy, which we'll just call gamma, is our you know pencil of curves. And let's take, uh, we have a function u from x to R measurable, and we have rho, an upper gradient for 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 you. Somehow these are all the players that we need to now fit together in some way to get our answer. So let's look at <clears throat> u of x minus u of y. Now I can integrate this over my pencil of curves probability measure. There are no curves here. This will just still be. Uh, should have done this the other way. So, right, u of x minus u of y. This will still be u of x minus u of y. But now using the property of the upper gradient, we can write this as the integral over gamma, uh, big gamma over little gamma of rho d s d alpha all right so so all we've done is use the the upper gradient property right here and now i'm going to just use a definition of the sem pencil of curves right because the sem pencil of curves tells me how to compare an integral over big gamma and little gamma to an integral over a ball which again an integral over the ball is what we're looking for because that's what the Poincaré inequality has in it See if we can go back up and remind ourselves where we defined Poincaré, right? So, so somehow this, we want to compare an integral over a ball to an integral over a ball. So we need to get a ball back. And this is what the Sem's pencil of curves does for us. And so here we are. So this is now less than or equal to C integral over ball rho dxz over mu of a ball x dxz plus rho dy dz mu of the ball y dyz dz. So now I think I was kind of prepared for that. So now I can just maybe 
quickly say it. So I want to switch my things because I wrote down the end of this proof somewhere else because it was a pain to write rho dx dz over mu of the ball again. So I just need my computer to go. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, I wanted to grab copy this. So whoops, let's come on. There it is. Cool. So this is what we have. And now, obviously right down here is I'm trying to estimate this. Because if I can estimate this, I can be done. So let me just make a few definitions. Now let's let BJ equal bx to the minus j r, where r will be the distance between x and y, and aj be this annulus again. Uh, but, and so here, let, let, let's quickly explain what we do. So all I'm doing is I'm estimating one of these, and by symmetry, I will estimate it both, just one with respect to x is an x variable and one with a y variable. So the first thing I do is I split it up into annuluses again, which is just fine and normal. Next thing I do is I introduce a constant. I, I, this is one, right? But the important thing, and I bound this below. So in our annulus, let's look. The smallest the, this denominator can be is when the radius is 2 to the minus j minus 1. And the largest it can be is what I put in this box here. And it's equal to 1, so I can stick it in. Um, now I take this one, this mu, the measure of the ball in the di di uh, in the denominator, and I make it an average. I take the mu, right? So this is a mu of a 2b over a mu of a b. So this bounds above by constant. That's what these two say. And that's where this constant comes from. The r comes out here. And now we're summing something to the j. I just take the max of this something, take the max of it. It's summable because it had its times to the minus j. You get this estimate. I will, I think I should just end here, but I can say this. Uh, I can't say, I can say the only things intelligible to me at this point quickly. So I don't want to want to do anything more. So what I will write is the inequality you get. Let me just write that down. So using this, what we can get, u of x, y. u of x minus u of y is less than or equal to a constant times the distance of x, y. Right, this is r. Uh, times, let me just copy it. This plus the one over y. So all I did. So I used this estimate twice for the first and second part of this summand. And this will imply eventually Poincaré. And what goes into this, just to finish up, what goes into this is a covering argument, just to be very general. And the fact gradients and functions play well together. Okay. But I think I should end here because we're, we're like out of time. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. 
Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Then. Yeah. Yeah, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. I don't think I fully understand the statement of the theorem. Is it okay. just saying like, if you have a metric measure space, oh, sorry, let me then, it. sorry? Yeah, I just wanted to bring it up for you, Ben, but yeah. Okay. But you can still ask, I've, I've now hit the right. Right, so is it just saying if you have a metric measure space and you can find one of these uh, pencils, mm -hmm. one of these families, then you get the inequality? Yes. And conversely, if you have the inequality, then you get some family of pencils. Yes. Then you get. Or, uh, like you get you get one of these pencils. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah, it says if, and I guess the other thing. And is, is it like explicitly constructed? Uh, yes. So, uh, right, right. So, so in this direction. Uh, no, I, I hate my tablet. I want to write. Um, in this direction, this direction, Ben, you're asking yeah. if it's explicitly connected. Uh, yes. So, I mean, they construct something, well, they explicitly construct something. And then from there, there's like a, an, another big theorem that says, well, if you have this, then you have that. So I see. it's basically saying see. What, what it said, what they construct is like a, f a functional Poincaré inequality, like a uh, semis pencil curve. So instead of, uh, let's not get into it. it I don't okay. have good yeah. But they do explicitly construct something. So yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And then could I also ask a question about this pencil of curves? Like, yeah. I, I don't understand what it means to integrate over it. Is there some sort of natural measure on, on so the family? I, or? Right. So when I define it, it comes with a probability measure. Oh, right. That's this like alpha yeah. thing that we're talking the about. The alpha thing. And so in the one, in our example, the, there was a natural one, right? So, so I, I parameterized it by this um, center line. Right. Yeah, the example made sense. Yeah. So. Okay, so the, the probability measure is what lets you integrate over the family. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah.